Good morning. Um, before we start, let's, allow me just to pray. Lord, as we begin the walking through this passage of Scripture, may your Holy Spirit speak to me and through me. May all of us here be open to what you would have us see and understand this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So we continue walking through this gospel of Mark, and we continue to be fascinated with not just each individual paragraph, but how each paragraph connects to the next and the next and connects throughout the entire uh, manuscript of this gospel. Today we are looking at this amount of scripture. We're in chapter 12, and today we will actually finish chapter 12 uh, and take a quick look at the beginning of chapter 13. But Mark chapter 12, beginning with verse 38 and 44. Here is what we're looking at today. This is divided into two different sections, two different stories. The first is Jesus warning the scribes. He's, he's warning them about the behavior that they are exhibiting. And so we find here this warning to the scribes. The next section has to do with a poor widow who makes an offering, and, and, and we find this story in the Gospel of Luke as well. And, and this story um, changes the way people at that time were thinking. And Jesus is radically coming up with something new here. And so we're going to be looking at the warning of the scribes as one story and the poor widow as the other story. If you're doing landscaping and you wanted to just redesign your entire property, your whole house, everything, just redesign it, having one of these babies on your front yard lawn is a good thing, right? I mean, there's, there's power beyond power with one of these things. And, and if you are working with them in your front yard and doing landscaping and, and stuff, you know, the, it, it could be nice. Well, back in 2005, we received this letter in the mail, a certified letter from the town. Typically not a good thing when you get a certified letter from the town. And I, I'm thinking, what, what is this? And, and so we opened the letter and it said that they had been notified that my septic system was not functioning properly, that it was in a failure mode, and that I had something like 30 days to submit some kind of a plan for fixing the problem, or we would lose our occupancy permit, you know, our occupancy ability to even be in the house. It was like crazy. And, and so we had our septic system pumped, and somehow, somehow, word went out and, and we had been having some problems through the years. And so now we're faced with having to design an entirely new septic system. And by the time we finished getting all of the plans and everything drawn up and submitted to the town, it was winter and it just wasn't going to get done until summer. So we had to manage carefully uh, until spring. Before we get into this script, this, this scripture today, uh, we need to understand what was the treatment of widows, what was the expected treatment for widows found in the Old Testament? How is it that, that scripture identifies how we should be dealing with and treating Widows. Well, here's some verses. As far back as Exodus, when, when Israel had been brought across the Red Sea, God made this command 
to the people of Israel. Do not take advantage of a widow or an orphan. God goes on to remind them, you were slaves in Egypt. Don't put people in bondage now that you're free. Do not take advantage of a widow or an orphan. Deuteronomy, you know, just the next book over, Deuteronomy 24, when you harvest the grapes in your vineyard, do not go over the vines again. Leave what remains for the alien, for the foreigner, for the fatherless, for the orphan, and for the widow. So we see this provision to care for, to take care of the widow. When we went through the book of Ruth uh, a while back, we saw the dynamics of a widow and how disconnected they were from society at that time, how they could not raise the funds you know, to have a living, that they, that they were often destitute and unprotected and vulnerable. And so God in his laws early on is talking about protecting them. When we look at Deuteronomy a little bit further down, cursed is the man who withholds justice from the alien, the fatherless, or the widow. All throughout scripture is this command to be careful how we treat foreigners, to be careful how we treat the orphan, to be careful how we treat the widow or the single mom. This is throughout scripture and and we as a church should be very careful how we manage and address justice issues with all three. But today we're focusing on this idea of the widow. Isaiah chapter one, verse 17, God says, learn to do right, seek justice, encourage the oppressed, defend the cause of the fatherless, the orphan, plead the case of the widow. Do you see a theme that God is saying Be careful, take care of the vulnerable, the disenfranchised, the the widows, the single moms, take care of them. We move on in Isaiah. Woe to those who make unjust laws, to those who issue oppressive decrees to deprive the poor of their rights and withhold justice from the oppressed of my people, making widows their prey and robbing the fatherless. Do you see the theme of taking care of the widow, the single mom? Zechariah chapter 7, verse 10. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the alien or the poor. There's a theme throughout Scripture. We're seeing it just right here. We're seeing it. And I'm only picking the shorter verses to be able to display it in a timely way. There's many more. Jeremiah chapter 22, do no wrong or violence to the alien, the fatherless, or the widow. Interestingly, Jeremiah even says this, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, the temple where Jesus is, where they're plotting to shed innocent blood. They're they're commanded not to do those things. So there's a theme throughout all of scripture to take care of the widow. So when I was growing up, my dad frustrated me. You know, like I'd leave my bedroom for 10 minutes and if I was gone for 10 minutes, he'd be standing there shutting the light switch off saying, shut the lights out when you leave the room. I'm going, I'm only gone 10 minutes. but. You know, perhaps maybe I left it on more often, more than 10 minutes, you know. Turn the water off once you're not using Close the refrigerator door. Close the refrigerator door. What do you mean? Are you trying to cool the whole house? You know, look, I'm just getting ice cream. Well, close the door while you're getting ice cream. And what is his problem? You know, don't open the window. The heat's on. I can hear it, you know over and over again, this idea of, you know, do this, do that, and, 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 and when you're taking a shower, you know, you can make it quick. 
You don't need 20 minutes to take a shower. And, and so here we are in this situation in our home in 2006, you know, where we're being super careful through this winter leading up to July. And, and I want to manage the water that's going into our septic system. So I became the shower Nazi. <laughs> Anyone. And by the way, I live by my own rules, all right? I can, I can shower and multitask and be in and out of there shaving and everything in less than eight minutes, you know? So, so when we're showering, I'm thinking 15 minutes is a solid, fair amount of time. So when anybody would ever walk into the shower, instinctively, I'd take a quick look at the watch. 15 minutes, it's easy to calculate, you know, where that lands. I'd make the mental note. And if the time comes around where the shower is still running and 15 minutes have gone by, I can gently go and knock on the door and say, hey, what's going on? If it lasts much longer than that, I think, you know, I could go downstairs and shut the hot water off. <laughs> so, so this one particular day, you know, I tell David that it's time to take a shower and so he goes in the bathroom and he turns the water on and I do the flip. So anyways, we're looking here at the warning <laughs> that Jesus gives the scribes. And let's just dig into this section here of scripture uh, right now. So as he taught, Jesus said, watch out for the teachers of the law. Now the Greek teachers of the law is just the word for scribe. It's easier for us again, but it, the word there is scribe and he's saying, watch out, look out for, be on the lookout, be on your guard. This is a warning that Jesus is giving to those who he's teaching. He's saying, watch out. Why? Why would they, you need to watch out for them? Well, he answers that. They, the scribes, they like to walk around in flowing robes and to be greeted in the marketplace. They dress for success. They, they're the celebrities of today. We, we see it when we watch the Oscars or the Grammys and the red carpet rolls out and everybody's in there. They're dressed to be seen. They, they walk the carpet. They stand different ways, you know, so that everybody can see uh, the craziness that they're wearing. Um, but here, they're, they're, they're seeking to be honored. It's not so much what they're wearing, it's why they're wearing it. They're seeking to be honored in the marketplace, to be greeted wherever they go. They have the most important seats in the synagogue and places of honor at banquets. You see, in the synagogues, they had chairs in the front, very similar to what we have here. I feel like, man, I shouldn't be saying this, you know? but they had seats here in the front so that everyone could see them. Let me tell you though, the pressure is strong. I've often wanted to scratch and I'm thinking, I can't scratch, it's being videoed, people are watching, you know, you can, you can scratch and nobody knows, but I can't. Um, but, but they have these seats that are in the front and they like it because they're seen. They're honored, and they do it in a place called the synagogue, where right behind them is a protective ark that has their copy of the Torah, the scriptures in it, and, and they place themselves in front of the scripture, and they think that they should have more honor than the word of God behind them. This verse 
strikes home after what we've just looked at. They know the scriptures. They, they rewrite the scriptures. They've memorized the scriptures. And Jesus accuses them, and he says, they devour widows' houses. They consume the house, the, the, the living, dwelling place of widows. They take it over. They, they consume it. They, they devour widows' houses. And, and it seems as though in the Greek, it seems as though the prayer is linked to that, that somehow they make lengthy prayer to somehow justify how they are extorting the widow. And across the board, the scriptures are saying, be careful Take care of the widow. And they're, they're taking from them their very houses. Such men will be punished most severely. Can you imagine the scribes hearing Jesus say that to them? Can you imagine the faces that they would make? What's your face when somebody tells you that you're going to be in trouble even more than anybody else. It's like, who, who are you? And, and this is what Jesus is saying. You will be judged. The, the actual Greek is, is more in the idea of sentenced. Uh, but, but punishment still fits. Sentenced more severely. Imagine, imagine that disciples hearing somebody finally put someone in their place. Uh, I, I was watching with, with my son Joe uh, a, a couple weeks ago, uh, the uh, Ramsey, what's his first name? Gordon Ramsey. He, he goes into a restaurant and, he, and there's this owner of this restaurant that is a jerk. And nobody can say anything to him because they work for him. And Dave Ramsey, not Dave, I keep saying Dave Ramsey, he's the financial guy. Gordon Ramsey, he's blunt as anything. He doesn't use church language by a long shot. Uh, but he tells them, and everybody, you see the camera panning out, and you see everyone that's working for him going, yes, you know, somebody is finally telling them. I imagine the disciples must have been going, <laughs> Oh, this is so sweet. You tell him, Jesus, this is awesome. So I look at my watch. <laughs> and the 15-minute mark has passed. The shower is still running. So I walk casually over to the door to knock on the door. Except the door is ajar. I open the door and I look at the mirror and it looks like that. It looks like a tropical rainforest. There's water. There's water dripping off the sides of the walls in the mirror and there is no one there. And I'm So I call out to this one son <laughs> who, who gave me permission to share. And, and I hear from down the hall, I'm in here. So I walk down the hall and he's in his brother's room and he's playing a video game. And I said, Dave, it's been 15 minutes. The shower is running. There's water dripping off the walls. He goes, I'm letting the water heat up. <laughs> I, and I, I said, Dave, Dave, the water's hot. You need to get in the, well, can I beat this level? No, you can't beat this level. You know, so now he's got that look that I had with my dad. Like, what is his problem? <laughs> 20,000 gallons into my, into my septic tank in the last 15 minutes. I'm losing it. So 
So I hover. So I hover right there because I'm not taking them, my eyes off of him. He's, and so he gets to the shower door, and I just said, three bucks. He said, what? I said, three dollars. What do you mean? Well, three dollars, that's, that's what you owe me, I think, in oil for 15 minutes of running the shower unnecessarily. Three bucks. He said, I don't have three bucks. I said, well, I think you do. He said, well, well, I don't. Well, get, get in the shower. The water is still running. So he gets in the shower. And, and, and I walk back over to the room with everybody else's in the room. And our son Sam is there. And Sam, he's nine years old. And Sam, on an essay that he had just written in school for what you are the best at, he lists at the top telling the truth. And Sam says, he has three dollars, Dad. <laughs> so, so now we've talked about the warning to the scribes. And now we move to the next story that we're looking at today, and that is of this poor widow. Now, right away we think the poor widow is some elderly person with a cane and, and, and so forth, but be careful not to overlay that. It doesn't say that she was elderly, it says she was poor. This might have been a single mom. This might have been someone in her teens. This might have been someone at any one of our ages destitute, disconnected, vulnerable, likely to be from the very scribes in the temple, being pressured to give more than she has. And so we see in this scripture as we dig into this, Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. So the temple treasury, as I have researched it out, seems to be across from what's called the court of women, you know, where women could gather in the temple area. That there were 13 offering vessels. They were, they were shaped like trumpets. So if you can imagine some kind of a, of a shape like a trumpet, and they were, they were made of copper. And, and there were 13 of them, and people would walk up and put their money into one of these 13. And it seems as though there's a clear view from a place where you can sit. So I would expect that Jesus and his disciples are sitting and kind of watching people giving money. So I would imagine that the richer people that um, wanted to be seen, perhaps the scribes, that wanted to be seen, that maybe they approached with their long flowing robes and their, and their amount of money that they're going to donate, and perhaps they would toss it in one at a time so you could hear the cooking rattle as it goes in. So everyone around them would say, Wow, look at that. And, and so here's the situation. They're watching people, constantly watching people. It doesn't say how long, but it seems as though quite a while. And they're watching people put things in. And I'm wondering if the disciples are there thinking, you know, because I might do this. I might be judging somebody and saying, whoa, based on the, the jewelry on that one, loud, long donation coming up. I, I estimate six coins uh, over the next 30 seconds. I, I, you know, and and maybe, maybe I might even think about you know, betting. You know, I bet this guy's going to give more. I bet this, one, I bet this person's going to. You, know, you might be thinking about that. Maybe, maybe that's what they, the disciples were doing. I don't know, but I'm just thinking what I might do. Um, so they're in the temple treasury watching. 
Many rich people threw in large amounts. Well, how did they know that? Because they're throwing them in singly at a time, hearing it going in, and large amounts take longer and make more noise. But a, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny. Two coins, a poor widow, two coins. Turns out these coins are called leptas. It's a Greek coin. And uh, the actual Greek for, for lepta means thin coin, thin coin. And, and so she put in two thin coins. A, a lepta, two leptas would be equal to one sixty-fourth of a denarii. One denarii was one day's wages. So I did some math. I'm not going to scare you a lot. Uh, but, but I just thought two leptas is one sixty-fourth of a day's wages. So I just took eight hours times 60 is 480 minutes. And then I just said 480 minutes divided by 64 means that she gave what the average person today would earn in seven and a half minutes out of a 40 hour work week. That's what she had, seven and a half minutes of a week's salary. I took minimum wage, $12 an hour, divided that by 60 minutes. If you're making minimum wage, you can just think of what you're going to do with the money because it's 0.20, 20 cents a minute. That's what you're earning, 20 cents a minute. At minimum wage, you would be making 20 cents per minute. If you work seven and a half minutes at 20 cents per minute, what she held in her hand today was about $1.50. Now, see, when I've read this before and I've seen a cent, I've just thought, well, anyone can toss a cent in because you can't buy anything with a penny anyways. What, penny candy, what is that? That's where you give five pieces of pennies or quarters or whatever for something that they call penny candy. So what do you do with a penny? You know, this was more than a penny. This was something that she could have actually bought something to eat. And it tells us that she took this dollar fifty and she put it in the offering plate, put it in one of these 13. I wonder if she picked the most prominent one that's visible by most people, or I wonder if she just kind of carefully walked up unseen, unnoticed, and put her offering, put that doll of 50, all she had. The Greek word there for all she had to live on, the Greek word is bios, that, where we get biology. This is the idea that this was what she had to physically live on, and she puts it all. I wonder what Jesus felt like when he saw that offering. So I said to Sam, how do you know that he has more than three dollars, uh, Sam? And Sam said, oh, he, he asked me to count it for him yesterday. <laughs> he has five dollars and thirty-five cents. Good to know, Sam. I'm checking my watch for the next 15 minute you know, time slot. And, and, and David comes out of the shower and he comes into the room and I said, three dollars, Dave. Because I would have let it go. You know, I wouldn't have forced it. You know, but, but now that I know that he's got three dollars, there's a principle involved. And if, you, and if you know me, the two things that will make me just go ballistic quicker than anything else would be lying, Disrespecting mom. <laughs> Two
Two things that, that I just, I can't imagine. And so he says, I don't have any money, Dad. I said, I have it on reliable sources <laughs> that you do. And uh, he said, I, I don't, Dad, I don't have. I don't have any money. I said, Dave, not only do you have $3, but you have $5.35, buddy. He goes, Dad, I don't have any money. Uh, Dave, and I'm now starting to ratchet up, and I'm, be, I'm, I'm moving from shower Nazi to dad mode, and that's much more dangerous. <laughs> and, and finally, I, before, before yelling, I gave him one more chance. And I said, David, if you don't have $3, then, then you tell me what happened to your $5.35. Where is your $5.35 that Sam counted just yesterday? Where is that? And David looked at me and he said, I put it in the offering at church yesterday. All of it. I didn't know what to do. I like quickly went from anger to proud. You know, I, I, I fell on my knees and I went into my wallet and I pulled out whatever was there and I put it in his hand. I said, that's yours, you keep that. And, 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 and you know what, I think I know. I think I know what Jesus felt like when the widow put in that small amount. Jesus goes on to say he, he's so thrilled, he's so proud of what just took place that, that this person gave all of what she had that he calls his disciples over to him and says, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. So they've been watching for a while, more than all the others, more than anyone else walking in with a sack of money and dropping it in to make a lot of noise over a long period of time, Two thin coins worth more than all. And he goes on, they all gave out of their wealth, but she out of her poverty put in everything, all that she had to buy us, to live on. Now this is not a text to say that we're supposed to give all that we have, and yet Jesus just talked in this temple. He just talked about loving God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul, and loving your neighbor as yourself, and here's someone who's living it out. She gave all she had to God, for God, and for the community that the money was supposed to be used for. She was living out the great commandment to love God and to love enemies. She was living it out. And he says that she gave more than anyone else that day. And is that where it ends? Do we walk away saying we need to give more? Certainly, you know, we need funds to expand the ministry, not just do the ministry that we're currently doing. But is that the message that, that, that Mark is trying to communicate to us today? I'm not so sure. I think it is a message that he's communicating, but is, but is this the big picture? Is this the big thing? Is this the prize, the prize of the day? Is this what we, what we walk away with? I don't think it is because Jesus has turned the tables on the hypocrites. And we think as we're reading it, and the disciples think as they're watching it played out that the hypocrites are the scribes. And they are. except there's more than one class of hypocrites in the room. There are connections in this scripture. There are connections to devouring the widow's house and the poor widow between the two sections. They're, they're connected by this idea 
of the widow. And, and they're also connected because Jesus is teaching in both sections, calling the disciples. Jesus is always on this idea of teaching. Calling his disciples to him is something that Mark has been doing. We've read it before as we've been building up to this. Look at some of this. This is amazing. In Mark chapter 3, Jesus went up on the mountainside, and what did he do? He called disciples onto himself. He called them. He called them to him. He began teaching them right here at this very moment. Mark chapter 6, calling the 12 to him, he sent them out two by two and gave them authority over evil spirits. What we're seeing as a flow throughout all of Mark is Jesus teaching the disciples something valuable. He goes on, Mark chapter eight. It doesn't take long before we see during those days another large crowd gathered. Since they had nothing to eat, what did Jesus do? He called his disciples onto him. Moving further in Mark chapter 9, we see something very interesting. There's the underline, Jesus called the 12. But remember the Pharisees? What was the warning to the Pharisees? Beware the Pharisees. They like the place of prominence. They like the seats in the best places. They like to be recognized for who they are. Here's our disciples. When he was in the house, he asked them, hey, what were you guys arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way, they had argued about who's the greatest. <laughs> the Pharisees put on the show, they try to say that they're the greatest and, and yet here the disciples are arguing with themselves about who is the greatest. Sitting, oh, I just went too quickly, sorry about that. Let me go back. Sitting down, Jesus called the 12 to him. And he said, if anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. Jesus is redefining success. Jesus is redefining what it means to be in his kingdom. He's saying, be the servant. Be the last. Uh, be the servant. Be the last. Chapter 10, we see a little bit later on. This is, this is after Jesus told them, be last. Don't have this paradigm in your head that, the, that you need the recognition, that you need the, the prominence. Don't, don't do that. And yet, a little ways further, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, two of the apostles, came to Jesus. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left in glory. Here the disciples are doing the same thing that the Pharisees are doing. They want the best seat in God's glory. They want the best seats. They want the prominence. They want to be recognized. They want to be the greatest. And Jesus is saying, you're not getting it. And they don't get it. Mark chapter 10, when the others heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. And then we see Jesus, what does he do? Calls them together. And Jesus called them together and said, you know that those regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I think Jesus right now is in this teaching moment. I think that when he was saying to the Pharisees, watch out for the Pharisees, I think he looked at James and John when, they, when he said they want the best seats in the synagogue. I think he looked at them and I think they knew that they had once asked the very same thing and I think they were cut to the heart and humbled by it. What if, what if we were thinking about turning the tables on us because this, is, this room is full of hypocrites, one of them right here talking to you. How is it that we manage different things wrongly? What if we were to wipe the condensation off the mirror and see who we truly are? What would we see? 
Maybe we would have to wrestle with things and maybe we should be wrestling with these kind of things. Are we impatient with others? Uh, are we thinking that somebody should be, uh, you know, further than they should be? Are, are, are we impatient with others and in doing so, are we ourselves being impatient with them? Do, have you ever done that? Have you ever told somebody that, you know, that you're frustrated with them and, that they're, and, and you get impatient? <laughs> and you're challenging them to say that they need to have patience, but you're impatient with their impatience. That doesn't make sense. Uh, sometimes we expect more to be done, but we're not really asking ourselves, is there more that we can do? Is there more that we should be doing, whether we're at work or here at church or at home in our families? You know, we expect more to be done, but are we doing things for others? Uh, are we doing that? How much time and money is spent? Are you critical about the time and money that someone spends on something? Whether, again, whether it's at family, whether it's here at church, whether it's at work, are you critical? But you're not managing your own money too well either. Jesus turns the tables on us. That's what, he's, that's what he does. Complaining about complaining. Have you ever thought about that? Oh, I hate it when they come over. All they do is complain. Well, what did I just do? <laughs> really? You can't complain about somebody complaining without complaining. I love it when they come over and complain. No, you don't. Do we desire the best seats? That's the question. Are we thinking that we should have more than we have? at the expense of someone else? Are we extorting the widows ourselves? Are we extorting the foreigners? Are we extorting you know, the, the orphans? Are we extorting people that, that God cares about? And, and you would think that the, that, the, that the disciples, they would get it. You would think that they would truly get it. And then they leave the temple. This is the first verse in chapter 13, just kind of a preview of where we're going next week. But as he was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said, hey, look, teacher, look at these massive stones. Look at this magnificent building. They're measuring success by the size of the building. They're measuring success by the, the beauty of the temple, and they're not getting it. Already, they just, they just saw this. And they walk out and they don't get it. Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Jesus would go on to say, they're coming down. We'll talk about that next week. But here's the thing. Um, we don't see true change in the disciples throughout the whole gospel. We keep thinking that they'll get it and they don't get it. We keep thinking that, that, that how clear, how much clearer can it be? We have people around us and, and we see them, you know, not getting it, messing up, and we think, well, how much clearer can it be? And, and we don't see true change in the disciples happening until the day of Pentecost until 50 days after the resurrection, they receive the Holy Spirit. And that's when we see drastic change. And I'm closing this by telling you this. If you're frustrated because you see others continually doing the same, they need the Spirit. They need to receive this Holy Spirit that helps them. We are frustrated with ourselves because we don't change. Are we relying on God's Holy Spirit? This verse is so important to me. Jesus talking to his disciples and he tells them, I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor. Helper, a better word, helper. Like Eve was given to Adam as a helper, someone to come alongside, to be spiritually fused together, you know, to be one. Jesus is saying that this spirit of truth, this counselor will be one with you. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him and knows him. 
but you know him. For the Holy Spirit lives with you and will be in you. If you're frustrated with life and you haven't seen change, is the Holy Spirit in you? Have you received that? It's pretty simple. You just ask him. Just ask and you'll receive. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds and to him who knocks the door will be opened. I need to seek out the Spirit's direction more in my life. How about you? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your Holy Spirit that you promised to us. May we be more inviting to your presence in our lives and stop pushing you away. That's my prayer. Help me. Help each of us. In Jesus' name.